Today we are talking about the power of uh, understanding the process of freedom. Now, one of the things that you found for those of us who have been around young people, or who have been within families where you have young people, one of the things you find is that most kids are of the opinion that by the time they leave high school and they go to college, they feel that they are free from their parents, you know? That they have been declared, they have declared independence. And because they've declared independence, nobody can stop them anymore. But the interesting thing is this. After about a month or two on campus, these same people that want to run away from their parents find a way of kind of finding their way back to those same parents. You know, the parents that they have been running away from, they kind of find a way to come back to that parent. And the question is, why is it that the kids who are for so long try to be free of their parent come running back to that same parent when they have the opportunity? Why? It's, it's, it's just, it, just, it just beats my imagination. Okay? If you leave that one alone, you look at so much of us here are from Africa. You will remember in the early in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s, most African nations were clamoring for independence, right? Everybody wanted to be free. Everyone wanted to rule themselves. Everybody wanted to be their own, you know, their own their own captain. But the interesting thing is that once those colonial masters gave freedom to the African nations, what do you find? These same African nations went back to the colonial masters and became <laughs> and became enslaved to them again. You start wondering, why did you ask for independence if you are going to go back again and enslave yourself? Okay? And if you come to the church, you see the same thing. A person has been praying and praying, God help me, God deliver me, God help me, God deliver me. The Lord finally hears an answer. Gives you the, 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 the answer to the prayer that you, are, that you are asking for. And then you find that same individual going back to doing the same thing that put him in bondage in the first place. You are asking for children, then you say, ah, oh, these children are a problem. You are asking for a husband, oh, this man will kill me. And you say, I mean, if the thing that you are praying for, you know, eventually, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's mind-boggling. But you see, we do these things as human beings. We do these things as families. We do this as a community. We even do it as a nation. And you find out that the things that we try to get freedom from, we end up gravitating back to those things. And it just beats my imagination. Now, in the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us the story of the children of Israel as they were about to leave the, uh, leave, uh, the captivity of Egypt. If you read verse number, if you read chapter 15, the Bible told us that they have just crossed the Red Sea. They have seen uh, Pharaoh, they have seen Pharaoh and all his hosts drown in the Red Sea. And then they will, you wake up one morning and then, you, and then by the time they got to the other side, they were rejoicing. The Bible tells us in that Exodus 15, there was a lot of rejoicing. Moses wrote a song. Miriam even waxed an album. There was r and oh no, There was rap. All sorts of music were going on. These guys were just jamming in the desert. They were so happy that they are free from, you know, they were, they were, that they were free from the, from the Egyptians. But all you have to do is read the next chapter. And then get to chapter number 17. These same people who were so happy, who were slamming and jamming in the wilderness, you know, they were doing all those kind of songs that were going on. The same people now started complaining and they wanted to go back to Egypt. I mean, you, you, you begin to scratch your head. This, you start asking yourself, why would you want to go back to the place where you have been, you know, where you have been enslaved for 400 years? Why is it that individuals, families, communities, and nations clamor to be free, and when freedom is handed to them, they go back into that particular captivity, or they cannot maintain it? Why is it that when we are set free, we entangle ourselves in the same bondage that we have been delivered from? Why? Okay. This has been the main question that we've been dealing with since the beginning of the month of July. You know, and we've been trying to answer this question to find out why individuals do what they do. Why freedom is very difficult. Why freedom never lasts. We started our first installment by talking about the meaning of freedom. We defined freedom, uh, we defined what freedom was and what freedom was not. And we concluded our first session. By saying that if a man wants to experience freedom, if a woman wants to experience freedom, if a church, a family, a community, a nation wants to experience freedom, the first thing they must do is they must come to him. He said not only that, they must acknowledge they are in need of freedom. Not only coming to him, not only acknowledging that you need your Lord, you must also accept the freedom that God offers on the conditions of the Almighty God, not on your own terms. You don't dictate to God what you want God to do for you. God does what he wants to do. So you come to him, you acknowledge your need, you accept his condition, and then number four, you and finally, you submit to his will. That was what we talked about in the very first installment of this series. And our second installment, we talked about what, you know, overcoming the spirit of irresponsibility. We said that 
irresponsibility in the life of anyone is the beginning of bondage and failure in that life. When you cannot take responsibility for your actions, when you cannot take responsibility for the things that you have done by yourself, you will not be able to make you, you will not be able to make progress in life. It doesn't matter. Be it responsibility with your time, responsibility with your talent, responsibility with your resources, in your relationship, responsibility in anything that has been committed into your hand. You name it. If you are irresponsible with whatever is committed into your care, Bondage and servitude will follow. Look at relationship. Look at finances. Look at everything. It works the same way. And we define irresponsibility as the refusal to answer to authority. We said irresponsibility is the lack of accountability. We said irresponsibility means that you are fickle and you are changeable. We said irresponsibility means that you are transferring blame to other people. We said irresponsibility is the spirit of excuse. When you are willing and you are ready and, you are, and there's always an excuse available at the top of your, to- at your tongue to be able to tell people why you are not doing what you are doing. And we concluded in our second installment by saying freedom will be elusive to anyone who is irresponsible. If you are not willing to take responsibility for your action, freedom, success, and all the good things that you seek in life might become elusive. Today we are taking a step forward in our studies. And like I said earlier on, I said we'll be looking at the process of freedom. The process of freedom. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13. And we are going to read just two verses this morning. Exodus 13, we are going to read two verses. The Bible tells us something very interesting in the verses of Scripture that we are going to be reading. And that interesting thing the Lord was telling us, the Lord, told, the, Lord was, uh, the Lord spoke in that verse of Scripture, is how he was going to take the children of Israel that had just been delivered from, e- from the captivity in Egypt, how he was going to take them to the promised land. That was the interesting thing that I want to talk about. And if you back up a little bit from, verse, uh, from uh, uh, Exodus 13, reading from verse number 1, the Bible tells us there that the Lord started speaking to Moses. He started giving Moses some specific instruction on how Israel was on how Israel was supposed to consecrate their firstborn unto him. The Lord started telling him how they were going to keep the fa- the feast of the unleavened bread. The Lord gave them instruction why they must do it and how they must rehearse it to themselves and to their children. By the time you get to verse number 17, which is where we are going today, Exodus chapter 13, verse number 17, the Bible tells us something very, very interesting. The Bible said that now Pharaoh has released the children of Israel. Okay, from captivity. But God decided to do something interesting. God decided to do something not uh, that, that was unusual. Let's pick the story up in verse number 17. The Bible tells us in verse 17, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. Verse 18. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly rank out of the land of Egypt. Now from this verse of scripture there are a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. The first one that I want you to pay attention to is in verse seven, uh, that verse number 17. The Bible tells us that Pharaoh eventually released the children of Israel after going through a lot of punishment. Why he went through I don't know but that's a different story. But after the Lord God Almighty has rained a lot of the, a lot of uh, plague upon the children of the, of upon the Egyptians Egyptians eventually let him go the bible said that you will notice that pharaoh let them go they were the israelites are now free to get you know, free of the bondage of Egypt. They are no longer under the control of the Egyptians. They were, they are, they, that was what the passage of the scripture is telling us. They are now heading to the promised land. Now the second thing I want you to notice from the verse of scripture that we read is this. You will notice in the verse of the scripture, verse number 17, the Bible says, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, then look at the next statement. It said, "Then that God did not lead them by the way by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near." In other words, instead of using the short route, the Lord decided to take the children of Israel in a very long, scenic route. Okay. The Lord decided to ignore the shortcut. He decided that they were not going to go into Israel. They were not going to go into the promised land the short way. The Lord gave them what I refer to as the journey through the wilderness. And the question that comes to mind is this. Why in the world would God do that? These people have been sitting in captivity for 400 years. Okay? They have been waiting to be delivered. Now they are delivered. God now say, okay, I think you guys can wait a little bit more. Let's now take a walk around the wilderness. Let's just keep seeing what is going on. All the dry land, all the snakes and all this. I mean, let's just go around the wilderness. Why will God do that? 
It's just like somebody who has been fasting and waiting to be released. And all of a sudden, the guy says, oh, you can wait another 40, you can wait for 40 more years and just walk around. I mean, it looks unreasonable. It looks to be out. It doesn't make sense. Now, Pharaoh has finally released the people. Now, God now decided to say he's going to take the people through the city crowd. And you begin to ask yourself, why will God do that? But before we ask what, why, why, why God is doing that, the third thing I want you to notice is the reason why God felt he was going to do that. Okay, why God took them through the wilderness. Look at that chapter, look at that same, uh, that same verse of the scripture. The Bible tells us that, the Bible tells us that God said, I'm taking these people through the long route. I'm taking them through the difficult journey of the wilderness because, look at the verse, uh, verse number 17 again. Then it came to pass. When Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. For God says, lest perhaps the people change their mind when they see war. And return unto Egypt. So in other words. The Lord is saying. That because these people. Might change their mind. Because these people are not ready to face. The challenges that the, that the world is about to throw at them. Because these people are still new. Just coming out of captivity. I don't want to take them through this way. I'm taking them through a place. Where they will not have that kind of trouble. Now this is a very very unusual reason. For somebody who has been waiting 400 years. To get into the promised land. Very unusual reason. And it forces you to ask the question, why would the Lord want, why would the people want to return to Egypt when they see war? Why would the children of Israel want to go back to Egypt after they have been delivered? I mean, they have spent 400 years in bondage. They have lived in terrible condition. Their children have been killed. The Bible says that their sons were separated from them. They were thrown into the Niles. The children, the Egyptians were not their bodies. These people prayed for deliverance. They asked for deliverance. And now the Lord is saying that because they have the potential of going back to Egypt, I'm going to take them through the city. Why would they want to go back? Why would anybody want to go back into, the, into, into captivity? Now, Israel is delivered, but why would they want to go back to Egypt? God knows that Israel will probably want to go back because, number one, slavery is a lot easier than freedom. That looks like, it's, it, it looks like a very contradictory statement. But it is very easy to be a slave than to be a free man. The reason is because it is easy for somebody to think for you than for you to think for yourself. It is easy for somebody to have them to take responsibility for you than for you to take responsibility for yourself. It is easy for somebody to tell you that when you wake up in the morning, do X, Y, and Z. And than for you to say, when I wake up, I will do X, Y, and Z. It is easy to live in slavery than to live in freedom. That's why the Lord did, that's why the Lord knows that these people, when they see opposition, they will go back. Number two reason. God knows that they will want to go back into Egypt when they realize that freedom requires responsibility. Because right now it's all good. Moses has been doing miracles. There was a, there was a frog. There was snap. There was fire from heaven. The water was. Talking. I mean, they were seeing this magic going on, and all of a sudden they are now walking out. Everybody is singing kumbaya, and they are going to the promised land. The Lord said, "These people don't know what they are getting themselves into." And as soon as trouble shows up, these people will want to go back because, tr because freedom is, requires responsibility. No longer can they blame the Egyptians for their, for their misfortune. They are now responsible for their own future. And God is saying, when that realization dawns upon them, they want to go back. Number three. Why would the Egyptian, why would the Israelites want to go back into captivity? God knows that they will want to go back when they, re, when they understand that freedom demands discipline. That you cannot be free unless you are disciplined. You cannot be free unless you know how to restrain yourself. You cannot be free unless you know how to be able to control every, every, every part of your life and put it under restraint. If you don't know how to do it, you are going to live in bondage. God knows that. And because he knows that, and he knows that the children of Israel for 400 years, they have never practiced, they have never, they, they have never practiced discipline. They have always been what? They have always been told what to do. They have always been told how to walk. They have always been told with you. They have always been given responsibility. And the difference between discipline from external forces and discipline of self-control or self-management, that particular discipline is what they do, have not learned. And the Lord is saying, when that realization comes to them, they want to go back. Okay? God knows that Israel will like to go back. Israel will want to go back when they realize 
that freedom that they have just been given requires self-management. Nobody will manage your time for you. That is why you see when the kids get out of school, get out of house, after high school, they think they are, they are big girls. They think they are big boys. I'm 18 now, I can vote, I can do whatever I want. Okay? You now get to campus, nobody wakes you up in the morning. Nobody tells you what to eat. Nobody tells you if you shower or if you don't shower. Nobody tells you, I mean, you are on your own. What you do with your time is your time. That's why the very first semester result is always very terrible. <laughs> Even for good students. Because number one, they have all this freedom and they don't know what to do with it. And the Lord is saying, the children of Israel for 400 years have been told what to do. Now I am setting them free. When they are free and they have not learned the discipline of self-management, when trouble shows up, they will say, ah, I think I want my mommy. And that is what happens to most of these college students when they first get. They want to go back home because at home it is safe. At home it is controlled. At home, mommy thinks for them. At home they have a personal chauffeur, their dad that drives them around. They have a personal cook that cooks for them. They have a personal house cleaner that cleans all their, you know, when they throw their clothes all over the place. Somebody's picking up after them. But in college, nobody does that for them. And this, the Lord is saying, when the children of Israel realize that this is what, uh, this is what freedom requires, self-management, they will say, no, I don't think I want this thing. They will go back. <laughs> so that's why. And finally, God realized. God, want, God knows that when the children, of, uh, children realize that this freedom that they have been handed over, that they have been, that they have been given, is a very difficult commodity to keep and to maintain. So they will want to go back. Okay? And God knows that Israel will want to go back as soon as they come to realize that what they have gotten themselves into. Yes, freedom is good, freedom is good, freedom is good. But when you time, when it's time to pay for it, that's when you know that this is a very expensive business. And God is saying, when Israel realizes that, they will say, God, ah, I think we can change our mind. They will have what is called a buyer's remorse. And God is now saying that because I don't want them to have a buyer's remorse, because I don't want them to begin to do the things that they have got, that they are used to doing, I will take them through the cynic room. That's why many of us, you find in January, you make up your mind, you say you want to lose weight. You say you want to begin to eat healthy. You say you want to begin to exercise. But by the time you get on the treadmill, and, and you know the first thing, the interesting thing about treadmills and all this exercise, the very first day, ah, many people you are supposed to start small and increase. We will start with two hours and jog and jog and jog and jog. And then the next day you wake up, your bones are not happy. Your muscles are not doing very well. And then you begin to say, ah, I think this exercise business is not going very well. You know, the exercise business is not going very well. And then you try again. You say, maybe if I miss today, tomorrow will be fine. You miss one day, you go back again. You go, before you know what's happening, your treadmill start gathering shirts. You start hanging your coat, you start hanging your, you start hanging your toe well and then you stop on it. The reason is because Response, uh, freedom is a very expensive thing. Freedom is very challenging, it's very tough, it's very difficult. And God knows that the day you begin to realize, the day the children of Israel realize that they have gotten themselves into a very tight corner, he said that day they want to go back. That's why many of us revert back to old habits. That's why we revert back to old relationships. That's why we revert back to the old way of doing things. The reason is because it is familiar. It is easy. It is predictable. We are comfortable in it. It's our comfort zone. We are used to it. We know the risk. We know the things that are in there. It doesn't push us more than anything. It is not something that is out of the ordinary. It is something that we can control. Yes, it is poverty. Yes, it is slavery. Yes, it is bondage. But we can manage it. We have, come to, we have come to understand how it works and we have developed a coping mechanism for that particular situation. In other words, though the people were delivered, though Israel had left Egyptian captivity, they were still not free. They were, still equi- they were not yet equipped to maintain the freedom that God has given to them. That's why the Lord says, these people, I think it's better for us to take the long road so that they can understand what they are getting themselves into. So the Lord planned to, took care, uh, to take care of that problem. And how did the Lord take care of it? Look at, uh, look at Exodus 13, reading from verse number 18. Exodus 13, reading from verse number 18. The Bible says, So God led the people around the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. In other words, this is the shortcut to take you from point A to point B. But I know 
that you are not going to be ready by the time you get to point B. So in order to make you ready for arrival at point B, I'm going to take you through the long road. So that in the process of meandering through the wilderness, you will learn some basic things. You will develop some muscles. You will develop some skills. You will understand what it means. In other words, to prevent Egypt, sorry, to prevent Israel from returning back into captivity, to prevent them from enslaving themselves, the Lord God Almighty said in order to be able to equip them to maintain and to sustain their, their, their freedom, I, the Lord Almighty, am going to take them through the long way. In order for them to develop the discipline, to develop the character, to develop the ability, the wisdom to be able to maintain the things that they have just been given. I am going to take them through the wilderness. And the question is, why the wilderness? Why the wilderness? The Lord could have taken them to the promised land and said, okay, you guys sit down. This is what you do when you get to the promised land. Number one, you have to wake up in the morning and shower. Number two, you have to wash your clothes. Number three, you, you, you can give them that lesson there. But how many of us have received lessons and you, as soon as you got up, you forgot every word that has been said? I don't want to say how many of us remember the message of last week because that would be putting people on the spot. But the point I'm making is that we don't learn by just listening. We don't. We learn when we experience certain things. We learn when we go through it the difficult way. There are people who learn, you know, the easy way. They learn by the experience of water. But majority of us will only learn when we see these things happen. And that the question I ask is, why did the Lord take them to the long way? Why the way of the wilderness? The reason the Lord God Almighty passed them through the long, through the long way is because, number one, God knew that Israel needed to learn the difference between deliverance and freedom. There is a difference. Between somebody being delivered and somebody being free. You can be free, you can be delivered from a particular problem, but you are not free from the habit that created that problem for you in the first place. You can go through the debt release system. Somebody will write off your debt, you owe 10000 they say you should pay two hundred, and you pay the $200. But if you have not learned the discipline of maintaining money, you are going to end, back, you are going to end up in the same spot that you have just been delivered from. So there's a difference between deliverance and freedom. And God knows that there's, because these people need to understand this thing, I will take them through the wilderness so that they can learn that lesson and understand it. For those of us who are close to me, you heard me say this. There is something we do when I was still growing up, when I was going to school back in Nigeria. One of the things we do in school is that they, they, they never they promote you on trial. Say you have, you are supposed to go to the next class by 50%. And you score maybe 47, 48. The teacher looks at you, you are a nice guy, you are very quiet, you are, I like your face. And besides, I don't want to see you next year. So it pushes you to the next class. That is what is called promotion on trial. In the kingdom of God, there is no promotion on trial. You got to learn the lesson. And if you don't learn the lesson, you are not going anywhere. That's why people repeat the same mistake over and over and over again because they have not learned the lesson that will take them to the next level. So God knows that for them to know the difference between deliverance and freedom, they have to go through the wilderness experience. Number two, Israel needed to learn that it is one thing to be set free from captivity. It is another thing to walk in the freedom that you have been given. Two different things. You can receive healing, okay? But if you don't obey the laws of health, you will end up back being sick. It's a very simple thing. So, there is a difference between deliverance and freedom. Number two, the reason why the Lord took them through the wilderness was because God wanted to teach Israel how to make a transition from deliverance into freedom. There is a transition that has to take place. There is a development that has to take place in your mind. There is a growth process that has to take place for you to be able to move from being delivered to being free. Because if you have not gone through that process, they can give you a million dollars today. If you have not learned the discipline of keeping money, if you have not learned the discipline of making money, if you have not learned the discipline of multiplying money, you are going to lose that million dollar in no time. That's why people who win the lottery, many of them end up broke. It's not because money don't like them. It's not because they are allergic to money. It's because they have not learned the discipline of keeping money. And they have not made the transition from deliverance to freedom. So God knows that in order for the children of Israel to learn how to make that transition, they have to go through the wilderness experience. That's why he took them there. Number three, the Lord took them through the wilderness because God wanted Israel to develop a freedom mindset. 
There is something that is called the poverty mindset. There's something that is also called the freedom mindset. When you develop a freedom mindset, you find out that even if you are living in confinement, your mind is free. That is what we read about. That's what we studied this morning in the book of Philippians. Though Paul was in jail, Paul was being restricted. Paul was in shackles. But the spirit was free. He was able to write those letters. He was able to deliver those who are in captivity. He was able to do great things, even in captivity. So God was trying to tell the people. He was trying to let them understand that Israel must develop the mindset. You cannot walk in freedom when you are living in shackles in your mind. As long as your mind is shackled. As long as you believe that the problem of your life is caused because of one white man, or caused because of one black man, or caused because of one particular corporation, I tell you, poverty will never leave your doorstep. But when you see yourself as the determinant of your future, and that God is the one that empowers you to be able to succeed, you find out that your mind is free. And because your mind is free, you are able to achieve those things that you set out to achieve. And God is saying, the only way these people are going to develop this mindset is when I pass them through. The wilderness experience. The reason number four. Why God took them through the wilderness. Is because God knows. That sudden freedom. Has the potential. To overwhelm. When you drop somebody in the middle of freedom. They have never seen it before. They have never known it before. They have never experienced it before. It has the tendency to overwhelm them. And when it overwhelms. If it is not properly managed. It will send them into captivity. It will send them into slavery. And God had to gradually introduce. The concept of managing their own affairs to them. And that's why he sent them through the wilderness. The Bible tells us. That the very first day, after their food was no longer provided by the Egyptian, God started raining manna from heaven. And the Lord gave them a very simple instruction. That instruction is gather enough for one day. Okay? Gather enough for, for one day. And on the weekend, gather two days worth. But because these people are so used to being provided food on a daily basis, what happened? They gathered on, 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 the, on the Sabbath day, they gathered only one day. And then the next day on the Sabbath day, they were going out looking for manna. And God said, I told you. That are two days. The point I'm trying to make is that when freedom is suddenly delivered to somebody, it has the potential to overwhelm. That's why kids, when they go to college, they misbehave. Kids that have been sheltered, a girl that I've never seen a boy before, or a boy that I've never seen a girl before, or you have never seen a, somebody has never whispered that sweet nonsense into your ears. At the end of the day, when you see that boy telling, "Oh, I love you," ah, you are the best thing that ever happened. Ah, this is an angel. You know that person is lying because he has never seen an angel before, but he's telling you that you are an angel. Anyway, you believe that kind of nonsense, and at the end of the day, what happened? You start doing things you are not supposed to be doing. You are supposed to be going to class and study, but you are not studying. The reason is because you have been given freedom, and it's now overwhelming. You don't know what to do with it. You have been so loaded with that freedom that you don't even know what to do with it. And unless it is properly managed, unless it is properly managed, you will find that you begin to do things that will put you into slavery. And that's why some people are hooked on drugs. That's why some people are hooked on sex. That's why some people are hooked into, you know, into, into a credit card for fraud. Because they are spending more than they can account, more than they can, yeah, they can afford. The point you are making is that when freedom is sudden, it overwhelms. And God is saying, these people have been given this very huge responsibility. They don't know how to manage it. For me to introduce them into this concept, I need to introduce them, I need to introduce them through the way of the wilderness. Most importantly, God led Israel through the wilderness because God knows that deliverance is instantaneous, but freedom is a process. Okay? God knows that deliverance is instantaneous, but freedom is a process. You can, you, you can meet an anointed man of God who lays hands on you and you are healed. But if you are going to continue to remain healed, you must learn how to eat well. You must learn how to exercise. You must learn how to, ex you, you must learn how to develop good, healthy habit. That takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. The same thing. Somebody might come in today and say, ah, this pastor, you are a nice man. All the debt that you owe, all your student loan, I'll pay it off today. Boom. If I have not learned the discipline of how to keep money, what happened? We'll go back into the same circle. Freedom is a deliverance, is instantaneous, but freedom is a process. And God knows that. So that the children of Israel are not under any illusion that God will always continue to kill the Egyptians for them. That God will continue to 
turn the water into uh, turn the rivers of Nile into river. That God will continue to give them the gnats and the frogs and all that. for them to be to, for them not to be under that illusion. God took them through the wilderness because God understood that there is a process to the issue of freedom. Now you can open the gate for a prisoner to walk out, but it takes time for that particular prisoner to learn how to adjust back into society. Okay. He learns how to understand because here's a man who is used to knowing that for him to go and pee, he has to take permission. For him to close his eyes, he has to take permission. To wake up, he has to take permission. To sleep, he has to take permission. He's used to a regimented life. And all of a sudden, you throw him out there and you say, okay, go and do whatever you want to do. And the man begins to wonder. There's this particular movie, I don't know how many of you, anyone who has seen it, it's called uh, Shawshank Redemption. Yes. You see this, uh, you see Morgan Freeman going into that man. He says, sir, I want to use the bathroom. He, and when he was, I finally, when he was released, the man said, hey, you are a free man. Use the bathroom anytime you want to use it. The point you are making is that you can open the gates for a prisoner, but it takes time for them to get adjusted. The same thing, the things that you are praying for God to give to you, the freedom that we are seeking, those freedom, the deliverance from, from the captivity of the enemy can be instant, but it takes time for you to understand. That's why the Lord took them. True. That's why the Lord took them through the wilderness. Exodus 13, 18 again. The Bible says, so the Lord God led the people around the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up orderly, in orderly rank, out of the land of Egypt. The question this morning is, Dennis, what is this process of freedom? What is this process of freedom? I want to see if I can accomplish this in less than 10 minutes. The process of freedom. What is it? The process of freedom that we're talking about. This is a series of actions or steps involved in achieving freedom. The series of steps and actions that an individual takes to achieve freedom. It is a sequence of interdependent action. In other words, one action leads to the other. Prompted by God and executed by the individual seeking freedom. In other words, God gives you a spark. A vision, a hunger, a dissatisfaction in your spirit. The individual that is desiring to see that vision actualized begins to take steps to the fulfillment of that vision. And before you know what's happening, it begins to lead in the road of what? In the road of freedom. You take financial you take financial freedom for for for. for for an example, you are driving down the road and you get to Green Hills, where our sister was spending the night last night, looking at what the second, well, looking at what the other one percent are doing. But that's a story for another day. So when you are driving, in, you are driving in, the, in Green Hills, and as you are going, you are looking at these big houses. These are beautiful, well manicured lawn. Everything is looking good, and some of them even have gate men. Some of them you need to press button to get inside, and you begin to dream. Ah, I want to live in this place. Ah, I want to endure this kind of house. And then you see somebody bring out a Bentley or probably a Maserati, and then you see all those wonderful cars. Say, wow. This is good. This is what life should be. And then you begin to wonder, ah, there's a collection call that is waiting for me at home. There are people who have not paid my car notes. I have not paid my rent. Ah, this is terrible. I want to get here. How do I get here, Lord? How do I get here, Lord? The Lord now tells you, if you ask me, I will give you. But you need to do some discipline. And what happened? The Lord began to put you on the road of discipline. Then you now begin to save your money. You begin to cut expenses. You begin to buy things that you don't You begin to stop buying the things that you don't need. You stop seeing sale as sale. And you begin to see it as a way of taking your money. I still do not understand how somebody will say you save money when you are spending it. But that's a story for another day. The point we are making is that and when you talk about it, the process of freedom is a step-by-step action that you take that will take you from where you are to where you need to be. So, but one thing you must understand is that that process of freedom is always initiated by the Almighty God. Because it's the one that gives you that vision. It's the one that opens your eyes to see that this is not the way you can live. You can live better. Your life can be better. You can aspire to something better. You can, you know, you can be all you can be more than what you are right now. The process of freedom starts and is initiated by the Almighty God. The reason is because we are all created with a yearning for freedom. We all want to express our God-given talent and gift. And we all have this vision, this dream, this asp- this aspiration to soar very high. And you cannot do that in captivity. So that vision is there. It is God that creates it. And when this vision, this hunger, it's now acted upon. The Lord God Almighty now gives you a promise. When you look at it, and you look at the scripture, and the Lord God Almighty says, whatever you lay your hands upon shall do to do you to prosper. Everywhere the soul of your feet shall tread upon, I will give it unto you. When you see the promise of the Almighty God, that is the next step. But the promise will not come unless there is a vision, there is a hunger inside your spirit. 
You desire something. There's something that keeps you awake at night. And you say, Lord, I want this thing. Then the Lord backs it up with a vision. Then he backs it up with a promise. And the same thing he gave to the children of Israel. If you read the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 1 or 2. It said that the, the cries of the children of the Almighty, of the children of Israel came up to the Almighty God. And the Lord did what? The Lord said he was going to send them a deliverer. He gave them a promise. And that promise was a person. The person of Moses. Number three step in the process of freedom is the process of struggle. As soon as you receive the promise, there will be opposition. There will be something that says, hey, who are you? Most of the people around you are broke. Most of them don't have cars. They have to push their car to start. What's your problem? You want to buy a Mercedes? What's, what's your problem? I mean, stop dreaming like that. There will be opposition. There will be something that will want to stand you. There will be, there will be, there will be powers that want to stop your forward movement. That is the next step. And how you are able to deal with the period of struggle will determine if you are going to make progress. The next one is the, the next step is the step of freedom. But that freedom comes if you do not give up. If you do not give up in the process of struggle, if you continue to strive, you continue to move forward, you continue to pray, you continue to save, you continue to desire, you kind of deny yourself of instant pleasure and begin to save yourself and say, yes, I want to get the result in the future. If you keep applying yourself, a day will come when you can experience that particular deliverance. And that is where a lot of people run into problems. Because they believe, or they have this idea, that deliverance is the same thing as freedom it is not okay this is what happened in the 1960s and in the 1970s when all the third world nations were getting their freedom we were getting their independence they thought independence was the end of the whole story yes the british have gotten out the french have left the belgians have gone you know the portuguese are gone now we are free as a nation and then the many of the colonized you know Many of these colonized areas, people became an independent nation. The same thing happened in America when they will have the civil rights movement in 1968 that led to the Civil Rights Act that was signed by President Larry Johnson. The idea was that people thought that when they were delivered, when the laws were signed, everything was fine. But this is 2018, right? From 1968. 50 years after. What is the condition? Basically the same thing. You go back to Africa. What is the condition of most of the African countries? They are basic, sometimes some of them are even worse than they were in 1960. Okay? Some of them are worse. You know? The point you are making is that the fact that you are able to struggle, the fact that you are able to get the deliverance, does not mean that you are free. It doesn't mean that you are free. It just means that you have gotten rid of one chain for another. The unfortunate thing about this phase is that the process of freedom is always, this, this, this particular stage of the process of freedom is always misunderstood. Because deliverance is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Because when you are taking, when that chain are broken, then you are free to now begin to seek the freedom that God has in store for you. While deliverance is, nece is a necessary component of freedom, deliverance is not a mean. It, it, the, the deliverance does not mean freedom. Okay? Deliverance is not an end in itself. It's just a means to an end. It's a means to freedom. That's why though Israel was delivered from the bondage of Egypt, it still remained in chains in their hearts. That is why many third world nations are still in chains to their former colonial masters. Now we can argue why that is, but that's a story for another day. The point I'm trying to make here this morning is that deliverance is not the same thing as what? As freedom. The next step is the step of the wilderness experience. This is the phase of the process where deliverance is converted into freedom. This is the phase of the process where people begin to develop the freedom mindset. This is the phase where the newly delivered person, the newly delivered family, the newly delivered nation begin to learn the art of living free. This is the phase where you will get a lot of support, but you begin to learn how to structure your freedom, how to train for freedom, how to govern the people for freedom, how to discipline to support and sustain freedom. This is the stage where you learn it. This is the stage where you learn what it means to be a free person. What it means to determine your own future. This is what people will refer to as nation building. This is what people refer to as character building. But it is the hardest phase. It is the hardest phase. That's why it took the children of Israel 40 years to learn the lesson of the wilderness experience. And God even had to change the entire generation out. Because those people were not learning. And because they were not learning, they were not getting what God wanted to get. So God had to wipe them out and bring their children into the promised land. So what you do in, the, in your wilderness experience, determine whether you are going to enjoy the blessings of freedom or the blessings of freedom will be an illusion for you. What you do during the time of your trial, during the time of your testing. 
on the heels of the wilderness experience is the sixth step of the process, which is the emergence of new leadership or the emergence of new, new, uh, new leadership skills. What I mean by that is this. The skills, the wisdom, the resources that brought you to where you are right now. My brothers and sisters, that skill will not be able to sustain you right now. If you are going to move to the next level, you have to add a new skill. You have to add new wisdom. You have to add new resources if you are going to move to the next level. Okay? In your place of work, when you first joined the company, you had a set of skills. Is that the same set of skills that you have right now? No. For you to be able to get promoted, for you to move to the next level, for you to even sustain your current job, you have to learn new skills. You have to develop new talent. You have to be able to grow yourself. And if you want to move to the next level, you get new skills, new knowledge. The same thing, if you want to maintain the freedom, either financial freedom or your health freedom, whatever freedom you want to maintain, there is a need for you to learn new skills, new wisdom, new understanding. You have to be able to grow. Because if you refuse to grow, you'll find out that you begin to go down. You begin to go into captivity. And that is why you find out that you're working with some set of people in the company. They refuse to share. It's not because they don't want to share. It's because they're afraid. If I teach this person how to do this job, the person will kick me out of the job, and then I will not have any job. When they're laying people off, somebody else already knows how to do my job, I'm no longer going to be unemployed. I'm no longer going to be employed. That is their mindset. And because of that, they refuse to share. But if you are the person at the place of work, you are learning new things. You are teaching people how to do things, how to do things. I tell you when they need help, who is the first person they call? They say, go and call that brother or go and call that sister. Why? Because they know that you are good at what you do. That's why the Bible tells us. It says, see a man who is good at what he does. He says, it's not going to stand, between, or stand before ordinary people. He's going to stand before the kings. Because if you want solution in that company, if the CEO wants something, if your manager wants something, if your supervisor wants something, who are they going to call? They're going to call the guy who knows what he's doing and who is ready to teach other people. They're not going to call the person who's, you know, I don't know whether we, they do it here in America, but when we grow up in Nigeria, when we're taking tests, some people always like to cover their book like this. You know? You don't like those kind of people because they don't like to share. They think that when you they think that when they when you get hundred, they will not be able to get their own hundred. The thing is that if you have ten students in the class, there's ten potential to get hundred. Your hundred is not going to disturb my own hundred, except if you are messing with a very crazy teacher. But that's the story for another day. The point you are making is that you have to be able to grow if you are going to maintain freedom. You have to be able to grow if you are going to move forward. To experience true freedom, new skills, new ability, new resources are needed to sustain freedom after deliverance. This is one mistake that leaders all across Africa are making. That is why somebody, he's a very good freedom fighter. He's a very good revolutionary. He was the one who was able to gather the people together to fight for the freedom of their country. He was able to lead them through the revolution. Now the country has received freedom. Now the country is now independent. That person still wants to remain there. You may not have the skills to take the people to the promised land. God even had to change Moses and give them Joshua. Because Joshua had, you know, Joshua needed the skills to be able to move forward. That is why somebody like Mandela, after spending one year, had to give it to Tabo Mbeki so that Mbeki can lead South Africa forward. The point I'm making is this. If you sit down and you refuse to develop your skills, what happens is that the people around you will not grow and all of you will start going down. And that's why you notice in this church we're always telling you, one of my desire is to be able to train everybody to do what I'm doing right now. So that I can sit down there and enjoy myself. If you ask Madam, I didn't sleep until about 3 a.m. this morning. It's not because I don't want to sleep at 3 a.m., but we have to polish this thing and make it look good for you guys. So that I can look good and you two can look good. But the point, but the point is that we want to get everybody to that same spot. So that we are all good at this thing. So that anybody who meets anyone of the, anybody who comes out of life long and enjoy, if they meet them on the road, they can discuss the word of God. They understand the word of God. They can minister the word of God. They can pray for the sick. They can heal the widow. They can do the things that God wanted them to do. That was the intention of the Almighty God. The Bible said that the things that I do, He said, greater things will you do. That is the intention of the Almighty God. And that was why He poured out His Spirit upon His people. But if we are going to move forward, skills have to be developed. And that is the next phase. And if you don't have the required skills, you will find out that you will not experience true freedom. And that is why after deliverance, for freedom to be secured, there is a need for a new set of leadership skills. And finally, the final step in the process of freedom is for you to recast a new vision. Recast a new vision. Okay, initially when you are still broke, 
Your goal is that you don't want to be broke anymore, right? Your goal is that you don't want the collection people to call you. You don't want people for fraud calling to say, hello, this is fraud credit. I'm collecting money for my money, you don't, for, my, for your car. You don't want them to be calling you. That was the intention. Now you were able to discipline yourself. You went through the wilderness experience. You did everything. Now you paid off all the debts. You are now debt free. If your goal still remains debt free, you are not going to move forward. But if your goal right now is this, I have paid off my debt. Now I want to have six months of living. Now I want to have seven months of living. Now I want to have a year of living expense. Now I want to build up my retirement account. Now I want to be able to give to my church. If that is your goal, you find that you have to recast a new vision. Because if you stay on the old vision, you will not be able to move forward. You will get to that goal. But you will not move forward. Israel had the goal. Initial goal was we want to get into the promised land. Now they are in the promised land. Then what else do you do? What else do you do? Do you go back out again and start coming back? No. You build new goals. So the process of freedom, the last step in the process of freedom is to restart the process all over again. Get new dreams. Get new visions. Get new goals. Get new aspirations. Continue to expand yourself so that as time goes on, you become better and better and better. My goal is that by the time somebody will see us 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they will say, oh, you need to hear this guy. I say, this guy is very good. You say, you need to have heard, you know. He, 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 somebody say, ah, I, I listened to him uh, 10 years ago. He was very good. Oh, and another person will say, why don't you listen to him now? He's even better. That is the goal. So that you set new goals for yourself, you are getting better and you are improving. Now, why did I go through all this story of telling you the process of vision? The reason number one is for you to understand that deliverance is not freedom. You can be delivered, but you may not be free. Number two, I told you this because freedom is a state of the mind. If your mind is locked up in slavery mentality, you cannot live a life of freedom. If you have this poverty mentality, everything you do, especially for those of us who come from Africa, if you want to buy this handkerchief, and you see they say it's $5, you start running mathematics in your head. You know what that mathematics is? You start doing currency exchange in your head. <laughs> this is, this is $1,000. This is $1,000 naira. If that is the way you are thinking, you will never be able to buy anything in America. But that's a story for another day. So there has to be, there has to be a freedom. You know, freedom is a state of the mind. You have to change your slave mentality. I'm telling you this story because freedom takes time. A man who is in a hurry can never enjoy true freedom. If you are in a hurry to be free of money, if you are in a hurry to make money, if you are in a hurry to lose weight, if you are in a hurry to become a, to become a what do you call it, an Oswaznika, you will need you, you are not, you, it, it, it doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out that way. Freedom takes time. Not only that, freedom cannot be rushed. And freedom requires renewal. It requires renewal. That is why if for those of us who are in, you know, if you're if you ta- you ever taking pictures, just take your camera, focus it this way. Leave it for a second. You find that the image becomes what? Becomes blurry. That's why you have to constantly refocus. Constantly refocus. The same thing is a law of physics. Entropy. Everything goes to the state of what? Instead of the state of degradation. You have to continue to renew it. And that's why Paul the Apostle says in the book of Romans chapter 12 that we read the other time. In verse 1 he says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. And in verse number 2 he said, this is, and do not be conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, make your mind anew. Present it before the Almighty God. Let Him give you fresh vision. Let Him give you fresh aspiration. Let Him give you fresh desires. Let Him open your eyes so that you can see new things. And the question this morning is this. Are you free? Or are you just delivered? Are you free or are you just delivered? Is your mind renewed and transformed? Or are you still holding to the old way of thinking? One thing I can assure you is that as long as you hold on to your old way of doing things, freedom, progress, success will be an illusion. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.